Well, this morning as we turn to our scriptures, we want to read from Psalm 40, uh, starting in verse 8. I will delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. Behold, I have not restrained my lips. As you know, O Lord, I have not hidden your deliverance within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. As for you, O Lord, you will not restrain your mercy from me. Your steadfast love and your faithfulness will, pre- will ever preserve me. Your evils have encompassed me beyond number. My iniquities have overtaken me, and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head. My heart fails me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let's pray. Father, we know that you, you are always there for us. You are good. You are our Father. Lord, when we, when we need help, you are always there. You are the great deliverer. Lord, help us to think about all of the things in our lives that you have delivered us from. Lord, I thank you that we are all brought here this morning, that we are here to to focus on you, to, to learn more about who you are, to learn more about the salvation that you have given us. Lord, I pray as we as we leave this place that we will leave change, that we will leave with a greater sense of, of, of how awesome and how mighty you are, of all the things that you do for us. Lord, help us to want to obey your laws that are written on our hearts, Lord. Lord, I pray as we continue this service that you continue to, to speak to us, Lord. Lord, teach us. Lord, encourage us. Convict us of sin, Lord. We pray that you will send your spirit in this, in this church this morning. That it will go forth and do the work that you called it to do. Lord, we just pray that uh, you will just have your way in this place this morning. Pray that you will be honored and glorified in every single thing. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Would you all stand with up? Stand up with us. So hopefully I can sing and we can all sing together. The Lord says that come before his his presence with thanksgiving and with joy. And God calls us to be people of joy at all times. And he, David says, I'll lift my hands in the sanctuary and I'll bless the Lord. And so in this sanctuary today, let us bless the Lord and let us lift up his name and give him go- focus as we sing these songs of worship to him. Let our hearts respond to him this morning. Amen. All right. go before us, you will lead the way, we have found a refuge, only you can say, sing with joy now, our God is for us, the Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress, raise your voice now, no love is greater, who can stand against us if our God is for us? Even when I turn back, still your love is sure. You will not abandon, you will not forsake. You will cheer me onward with never-ending praise. Sing with joy now, our God is for us. The Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. Praise your voice now, no love is great. Who can stand against us if our God is for us? Neither life nor death can separate us. Hell and death will not defeat us. He who gave his son to free us. with 
with joy now, our God is for us. The Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice now, the love is greater. Who can stand against us if our God is for us? Sing with joy now, our God is for us. The Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. this morning. He's for us. Amen.
What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name. thank you for your name. We thank you for your name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It is a holy name. Hallelujah. Who else can make every king back? 
Gracious Father, thank you. Help us to always be thankful. Help us not to wait for November to be thankful. Help us be thankful always and rejoice in you always. And God, help us to rejoice in your word and the good things that we see you doing in your glory. And help us to remember that every good and perfect gift comes from you. And so, God, we just ask as we open up your word that you would guide us. Help me, Holy Spirit, to get out of the way. We don't need to hear from me. We need to hear from you. And so, Lord, I just ask that you would bless our time together and help us to get these things um, through our minds and into our hearts and that we all continue to have hearts more for the king than we had yesterday. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, church, we are continuing our sermon series in the book of Samuel called A Heart for the King. And so we've, we've been seeing the attitude of David in recent weeks, and we've already seen him approach life a bit differently, to say the least, as opposed to how everyone else was behaving. He had faith. He had the faith to see Goliath for who he was while everyone else was afraid. You often see fear and faith contrasted. This is why David has a heart for the king of heaven. It made him a faithful man. He is described as a man after God's own heart, a God first man. And so the Bible tells us over and over again that it's the Holy Spirit, especially in the understanding of the new covenant, it's the Holy Spirit that makes us different from one another. The Spirit of God was with David at his anointing back in chapter 16. If you want to review, that's where that happened. And it's pushing him forward to be the king selected by God. And so this king will be a lion of the tribe from Judah. And we're leading up to that moment where David will one day rule Israel and the future ruler of the kings of the earth that we so often talk about and gather around, Jesus Christ, will descend from the very throne of David. Last week we, we, we saw that everyone was loving David after he defeated Goliath. Everyone except one person was loving David. Saul. David's zeal for the glory of God led to a great friendship with Jonathan, Saul's son, and much love and respect from the Israelites, but it only took one song to make him the enemy of the king in residence. That song went a little something like this. Saul has slain his thousands. Old David has slain tens of thousands. Whoa. And so this caused the mad king to further descend into dark thoughts. He tried to kill David. He throws some spears at him while he's playing his lyre. Um, he, uh, Saul uses his own daughter for marriage uh, with a ridiculous bride price, not silver. David, I want you to kill a hundred Philistines and Give me something to show they are Philistines. But he forgot that the Lord was with David, and David defeated a hundred Philistines plus a hundred more and brought back to Saul the evidence of that. So David marries Saul's daughter, Michal, and that's where we left off. Saul is living in fear, fear of David and fear of what he might lose. And no matter how many times he attempts to get David, he keeps, David keeps having success. And there's a reason for that. Our sermon title for this morning is God Provides Protection. Amen? Do you believe it? Do you know that God is in control and his enemies can only go so far? His enemies can only go so far. We're going to look at 1 Samuel 19 in a moment. But the devil and God, I want us to remember this, the devil and God are not on an equal playing field. Okay, God is God, the devil is a fallen angel. The creative power and divine authority belong to our God and our God alone. But sometimes the kings of the earth, or the devil, the powers that be, they show their hand, they rebel against what God is doing, and they attempt to thwart God. But any attempt to thwart the Almighty is a vain attempt. But it doesn't stop his enemies from trying so we're going to go ahead and jump into our passage. And as always, may the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. 1 Samuel 19. And Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and to all his servants, and that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David. And Jonathan told him, uh, 
told David, Saul, my father, seeks to kill you. Therefore, be on your guard in the morning. Stay in a secret place and hide yourself. And I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are. And I will speak to my father about you. And if I learn anything, I will tell you. Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, Let not the king sin against his servant David, because he has not sinned against you, and because his deeds have brought good to you. For he took his life in his hand, and he struck down the Philistine, and the Lord worked a great salvation for all Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why then will you sin against innocent blood by killing David without cause? Saul listened to the voice of Jonathan, and Saul swore, As the Lord lives, he shall not be put to death. Jonathan called David and reported to him all these things, and Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as before, and there was war again. And David went out and fought with the Philistines and struck them with a great blow so that they fled before him. Then a harmful spirit from the Lord came upon Saul as he sat in his house with his spear in his hand, and David was playing the lyre. And Saul sought to pin David to the wall with the spear, but he eluded Saul so that he struck the spear into the wall. David fled and escaped that night. Saul sent messengers to David's house to watch him, that he might kill him in the morning. But Michal, David's wife, told him, If you do not escape with your life tonight, tomorrow you will be killed. So Michal let David down through the window, and he fled away and escaped. Michal took an image and laid it on the bed and put a pillow of goat's hair at its head and covered it with the clothes. And when Saul sent messengers to take David, she said, He is sick. Then Saul sent the messengers to see David, saying, Bring him to me in the bed, that I may kill him. And when the messengers came in, behold, the image was in the bed with the pillow of goat's hair as its head. Saul said to Michal, Why have you deceived me thus, and let my enemy go, so that he has escaped? And Michal answered Saul, He said to me, Let me go, why should I kill you? Now David fled and escaped. And he came to Samuel at Ramah told him all that Saul had done. And he and Samuel went and lived at Naoth. And it was told Saul, Behold, David is at Naoth at, in Ramah. Then Saul sent messengers to take David. And when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying and Samuel st standing his head over them, the Spirit of God came upon the messengers of Saul, and they also prophesied. When it was told Saul, he sent other messengers. They also prophesied. And Saul sent messengers a third time, and they also prophesied. Then he himself went to Ramon, went to the great well that is at Saku, and he asked, Where are Samuel and David? And one said, Behold, they are at Naoth in Ramah. And he went there to Naoth in Ramah. And the Spirit of God came upon him also. And as he went, he prophesied until he came to Naoth in Ramah. And he too stripped off his clothes, and he too prophesied before Samuel and lay naked all that day. And all that night, thus as it is said, is Saul also among the prophets. This is the word of the Lord. What a strange incidence. All of a sudden, everyone is engaged in prophecy mode. They were out of themselves. They're unable to do what they were planning to do because the Spirit of God fell upon David's pursuers and caused this type of erratic behavior. So their chase of David is interrupted in a way that no one would have ever thought up. The Lord can use a good thing on his enemies to stop his enemies. It's incredible. When we come back to the top of the passage, evidently Saul <clears throat> has had some time to stew on everything that uh, he's, that's happened with David and we don't always know, you know this, that God sees the heart. Man looks on the outward appearance, God sees the heart. Over and over again, we're told that. We were told that in 1 Samuel. However, the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, what does the mouth do? Speaks. And so we know that Saul's relationship with the Lord was bad, and now... His son and his servant are, servants are going to see a little bit of that heart speak. Verse 1, Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and to all his servants they, that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David. Now, you might think, bad guy 101, this is not the most calculated approach 
to go after your enemy, especially since everyone is loving David. And we don't ultimately know the soul situation of other people, but sometimes people say things that show something is up. An evil heart assumes that evil will be understood and complied with. That's what happens. And so Jesus calls this, in the New Testament, bad fruit. Saul is gripped by evil, and the old story of Joseph rings true to this day. We know that Joseph's brothers, you know Joseph and his brothers, Joseph's brothers tried to get rid of him with evil in their hearts. And they did eventually repent of that evil. But what they intended for evil, God intended for good. Amen? These, this outburst of villainy. And, and bad guys, to be honest, are always shown as giving away their plans in the movies, right? It's like, oh, let me tell you what I'm going to do. Like, tells the, bad, the good guy everything he's going to do. And, and, and so maybe that's more true of real life than we realize, though. Maybe that's not just drama. Because this led to protection. This plan led to protection. An evil conversation led to a good, good and godly protection. And so God takes what the enemy means for evil, and he turns it for good. He did it with David. Don't think that he can't do it for anybody in this room or anybody out there at all. He can do it for you. He works all things together for our good. Those who are called according to his purposes. The king of the universe is working all things together for your good. Saul did not realize his own son's heart had been knit to the heart of David because he's blinded by evil. Verse 2, Jonathan told David, Saul, my father seeks to kill you. Goes and tells him right away. Be on your guard in the morning. Stay in a secret place. Hide. I'm going to go talk to dad. All right? And uh, I'll let you know how it goes, but we're going to go have a conversation with dear old dad about what he said about you. But you should probably stay hidden for a while. Out of the abundance of Saul's wicked heart, he spoke, which led to protection for David from the king, from his own son. It turns out, you know, well, the apple, yeah, you see something, you see somebody do something that an ancestor did. Well, the apple doesn't fall, fall far from the tree, does it? It turns out that the apple doesn't always fall far from the tree because Jonathan and Saul could not be any different. Jonathan goes on to have a conversation with his dad, with the king, and he's going to reason with dear old dad about this action and behavior. Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul. Verse 4, his father said to him, let not the king sin against his servant David. Don't do it, because he hasn't sinned against you. His deeds have brought good to you. David has been good for you, Saul. He's been good for the kingdom. He took his life in his hand. He went out when nobody else would. He went out and fought Goliath. And the Lord worked a great salvation for Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why will you sin against innocent blood by killing David without cause? He says innocent blood there because in the law of Moses, this, the, it spoke directly against the shedding of innocent blood. David hadn't done anything wrong. But remember what he had done. Remember how he gave us the victory. This guy is an ally, King Saul, dad. He's not an enemy. Don't you see it? Can you reason with evil? That's the question here. Can you reason with evil? And so, in fact, we're talking about a king who goes through mad instances and fits of rage. Can you reason with madness? Hold on. All in all, Saul's a pretty unreasonable fellow. But it turns out for a moment that Jonathan could. Verse 6, Saul listened to the voice of Jonathan. Saul swore, as the Lord lives, he shall not be put to death. Why did he listen? And you could say, well, did he listen? He listened for a moment. Why did he listen for a moment? And that brings us to the first point. Reason alone cannot defeat evil, but it can help restrain it. Okay? Put some chains around it. It can't kill it. And I hope this makes sense. It's important for us to remember this. We, we might have a tendency to divide the physical and the spiritual. The apologetic, the defense of the faith, and the physical, the spiritual. So 
Like, this is a reason problem. This is where we need to reason and have a debate about it. This over here, though, this is a spiritual problem. But in reality, all problems are spiritual problems. All problems. Evil understands evil, too. You know that, right? Evil understands evil. It doesn't take a moral guru to explain to Saul that this was not a good thing that he wanted to do. The Bible tells us that the natural man has a level of understanding of good and evil. Romans 1, 19 through 20. I want to, I want to put this in front of you. Romans 1, 19 through 20. Speaking of man in the natural state. What can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. This is general revelation. Everybody deep down knows this. For his, whether, whether they're a Christian or not, his invis, invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. Evil understands evil. It, it, they're, they're, they are without excuse. They can't say, I just didn't know. I just didn't know. And so an evil heart has some level of understanding of what is right and wrong. So Jonathan reasons according to goodness with his father, and reason appears to work for the moment. Saul stops. He says, all right, I won't put David to death, but we know by the end of the, this chapter, or, or the way the rest of the chapter goes, and the rest of this book in the Bible, that Saul does not stop. He does not back down. He keeps going after David. But for the moment, he's not going to be put to death. You ever have a toothache? Anybody have a toothache? It's terrible, isn't it? Awful. And so you might take some kind of mega Advil or your choice of painkiller, uh, and it'll make the pain go away, right, for some time. But does it fix the problem? No, because there's a bigger problem. The overall health of the tooth has to be dealt with. Pain is a response from your body telling you that something is wrong. Jonathan's reasoning exposed Saul's silliness in the moment, restrains his actions, but does not solve the problem. This is an Advil treatment to a deeper problem. Reason can expose evil, but it can't eradicate it. Reason can expose evil, it can't defeat it. The law spoke against the shedding of innocent blood, but we know as Christians, here's another thing, guys, we think, well, you know what the problem is? Information. Right? He just doesn't know. Like, he just doesn't know. And maybe if we just inform people that they will live better. That's not always the case. There's signs not to litter everywhere. There's signs not to do this or that. Sign, sign, everywhere a sign. Guess what? People don't listen to those signs. Because information is not always the problem. There's a difference between knowing what is right and wrong and having the power to live right over wrong. So Jonathan reports this to David, and it's all okay. All is well for, for the time being. being David is uh, briefly restored as a military officer and a musician in the king's court. We move on, and what happens? More success for David, which equaled to success for Israel. But Saul was blinded by his hatred and couldn't see that. Uh, there's war again. David goes out. He fights the Philistines. He struck them down. It's like Goliath 2.0. It happens again. They, fl they flee. It's going well. But meanwhile, a harmful spirit from the Lord came upon Saul. And as he sat in his house with his spear in hand, probably just looking at that thing, looking at that thing. And David's playing the liar. You've seen this before, guys. Saul starts chucking spears at David. If David probably, if David maybe gave Saul the benefit of the doubt the first time, oh, he's having a bad day, throwing spears at me. He did not give him the benefit of the doubt this time. He knows better after Jonathan's report, this guy's trying to kill me. And this is very sad. So the, the cruel irony that's in front, of you, in front of us here is David is striking down the Philistines and Saul is trying to strike down David. An evil heart driven by madness isn't concerned with the big picture. That's why you see it over and over again. Saul is an image of the self, the self apart from God. David is an image of a man after God's own heart, a man set on glorifying God and all that he does. But David, for doing the right thing, 
is being treated like an enemy of the, by the king of Israel. Jealousy does not know how to cheer on the success of another. It only knows how to break down others and build up the self. Envy is such a blinding sin. It's a perspective killer. Jealousy is. The success of David benefited Saul, but he was blinded by his own ego. He couldn't see it. And so uh, I think of what John Owen said. Uh, John Owen th- said, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. That's what's happening to Saul. Saul is ensnared in sin. He's just consumed by it. So David runs away after another spear-chucking tantrum. He comes home to his wife, and now another layer of protection is added. Saul sent messengers to David's house. Watch him. He might kill him in the morning. But Michal, David's wife, Saul's daughter, told him, if you do not escape with your life tonight, tomorrow you will be killed. So Michal let David down through the window, and he fled away and escaped. It did not take long for more protection for David to show up. God provides protection, church. You see it? See it? The, 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 his kind is the most secure, and it's the absolute best. For instance, you see what, who the characters are in the story that are protecting David so far. You can't, we can't look at this lightly. These are his own kids. These are Saul's kids protecting David from their father. So do we realize how powerful God is in working all things according to the counsel of his will? Jesus wasn't crucified until the proper time. God the Father protected God the Son from his enemies until the exact moment came that it was time. He was not going to be captured and given over to Pilate until God decided it was time. Things do not happen outside of the will of God. God knows exactly what's going on, and that's why Jesus looks at Pilate. Jesus in custody. The man in power looks like he's in control of the situation. Jesus is in custody, and you know what he says to Pilate? You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. That's a pretty high uh, claim, right? Jesus is the ruler of the kings of the earth. This is my father's world. It's not a pretty song. It's a reality. It's a pretty song too, but it's a reality. God had plans for David, and no plan of Saul's was going to interrupt God's will. The Bible says that the heart of a man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. Now, there's something here a little odd. It doesn't really line up with everything else in the passage. Michal took an image and laid it on the bed. An image, you might have idol, pillow of goat's hair, its head and covered it with clothes. And so we, we've, all, we've all seen the whole fill the bed up, make it look like someone's sleeping in it, use a basketball for the head or whatever. But anyway, Michal uses an idol. And why they have this in their house, we don't know. We don't know. Her protection of David is protection, but it's not the same level. It's not the same kind of protection that Jonathan provided as a defense of David. She will show her own problems later in the story of David, but she deceives David's pursuers with the old, fill the bed up, he's sick, he can't come out trick. But that's not good enough for the mad King Saul. And if you don't, you know, madness, like this is, this is mad. What a guy. Send the messengers to say, see David saying, bring him up to me in the bed that I may kill him. What a guy. Hold him right there. He does not have any honor. He does not care. He'll end him in the bed. And when the messengers came in, they might have been, remember, everybody's loving David. These messengers were probably even relieved that David was not in that bed. The pillow of goat's hair as its head. Uh, They've been deceived. Daddy Saul turns to his baby girl. Saul said to Michal, why have you, this this is just rich, to be honest. Why have you deceived me thus and let my enemy go so that he has escaped? You remember that when, when he was offering to marry one of his daughters to David, 
he was doing it with evil in his heart, hoping that he could get the bride price in. I'm going to send him off to his death, and it didn't work. But he has the gall to tell his daughter, hey, why have you deceived me and let my enemy get away? And she answers Saul. He said, he said, let me go. Why should I kill you? Eh, that's not true, is it? That could have been used to protect herself from harm in the situation because she was the one who told David to escape. That's the truth. She said, David, you need to get out of here. And then she says, this is what David did. David did not do that. God continues to protect David at every turn. He can protect anyone. And so my question for us this morning, you know, everybody's talking about disaster. Have you sought shelter from God? Because there's no shelter like the protection that he provides. And that brings us to the second point. There is safety in the shadow of of the Almighty. Safety is something we naturally seek. Every organization that does anything productive naturally is plagued by laws from something called OSHA to make sure that safety is first, a safe environment. And sometimes it goes very far because we find out really fast that life is not safe. But we want to try to regulate things to make it as safe as possible. And sometimes that's okay. Sometimes it's a little crazy. But harm comes to us in many forms. And at the end of the day, everyone wants shelter from powers and elements. When that sprinkle comes down, you might stand in it and sing it in the rain. You might pull one of those. But when a deluge comes down, you probably start looking for something to cover Oh my goodness, I can't stand in this. This is a little too intense. So we seek shelter in a storm. We build storm shelters when we have fear of natural disasters. Where is the help? Well, we have something better than that help, than the temporal help. We have a spiritual help way beyond any of this. We actually have help in the hurricane. And so I actually want to pull up the Bible verse from where this comes from Psalm 91, where this point comes from. Psalm 91, 1 says this. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Do you believe that? Do you believe it? On the worst of days? There are three pairs, if you will, to take note of here. So first, Sentence, second sentence, and they're all united by three pairs of words. Dwells and abide are the first. To dwell or to abide is to be somewhere, to be in the state or a presence, to be in this state or this presence. Second, shelter, shadow. Shadows, what do they do? Cover. They cover a surface area. A shelter is a place of refuge that you will find refuge by going under it. So coverage. And then finally, most high and almighty. Those are names that can only be ascribed to one. You have no rival. You have no equal. <laughs> you see... He is most high and almighty. He is most powerful is what that means. Almighty, all powerful. He is most high. He is above all things. In him we live and move and have our being. He is the supreme being through which anything that is made was made. And we are told, written by none other than King David, he who dwells in the shelter of the most high will abide in the shadow of the almighty. The be this beautiful psalm, I can't help but think, talk about singing your experiences. He lived out what he wrote about. The spirit of the living God was upon David. He knew what he was talking about. Do we know what he's talking about? 
Do we have any idea what he's talking about? Or do we think that something can get us apart from the will of God? God didn't see that coming. I don't, a famous early church saying of, of some Christians was this. And by the way, the early church, you want to study that sometimes. You want to find joy among suffering. There it is, like no other. But you can hear this. So a famous early saying of the church was this. You can kill us, but you can't hurt us. Whoa. What is that? It's perspective. It's perspective that reminds us that death is not the end. But even in the present heavens and earth, even right now, we have a shelter in the storm. And that shelter is none other than the Most High, the Almighty God Himself. And so tell me, church, with the all-powerful God being for you, can anything get you that he wasn't ready for or knew about? Have you taken your issue to him in prayer? Do you trust him no matter what? No matter what? I'm talking like, like the Job level of trust. Like Job's friends were wonky, you know. And, and if you get time, read the book of Job. But Job trusted God even having nothing left. No matter how many waves are crashing around you, do you trust God? Or winds blowing around you? God provides protection in the present state and in the fullness in the age to come. We can lean on the everlasting arms right now. And we can know this too, that the perishable, we're all perishable. These bodies are not everlasting, but someday the perishable will be changed and enter into the everlasting state that is to come. But you have to believe that there is safety in the arms of Jesus. You need to be present with him. Be present with God, you have more peace. It doesn't mean that you won't have trouble. It doesn't mean you won't have difficult situations. That's not reality. But it does mean that the maker of heaven and earth will be with you through every bit of it. Seek shelter elsewhere, and you might as well build a house on the sandy seashore. But shelter in the shadow of the Almighty is sure and steadfast. Christ Jesus is called the sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, which means no power of hell or scheme of man can ever thwart what he says must come to pass. David sang about it, and did he live it? I want to know who's on the phone right now, man. That's crazy. It's not crazy. All things together for good. Take that call. What happened to David after he escaped out the window? And, and just again, I want to blow this up because I think we forget it. Because we got all these mugs that say, God's going to slay your giants. David just defeated the giant. And his life got a lot harder. Okay? Don't focus on the highlight. Ooh, there's the climax of the story. Look at the, what comes after it. Because it's a reality of the kind of life that we live. He flees and escapes. He comes to Samuel at Ramah. And he told him all that Saul had done to him. And he and Samuel went and lived at Naoth. Okay. The story seems to be unfolding that the prophet Samuel will be the source of protection for David. He was no doubt a source of comfort. I bet they had a lot to talk about, right? Samuel and David, they're both men full of faith because they both, at the root, they have hearts for King Jesus, for God Almighty. But the help doesn't come from Samuel. The help comes a different way. And by the way, God protects David in just this chapter alone four times. Four times. Jonathan intervenes for David. David is somehow able to perceive that a spear is about to come at his head and gets out of the way of it. Michal, Saul's daughter, lies for David. He didn't ask her to do that. And then fourth and finally, might be the most surprising, there's a miraculous way of intervention. Saul sent messengers to take David when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying and Samuel setting his head over them. The Spirit of God came upon the messengers of Saul 
and they also prophesied. This is what we call contagious, spontaneous worship. Did you know that God can cause his enemies to take part in worship? He said, we know, we read that earlier, we know that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord, but do you know that he can make him, them do that right now, right this instance, if he so chooses? And by the way, he can choose whatever method he desires to carry that out because he is God. God by definition. He does whatever he pleases. And so what a testimony this must have been to the prophets. The prophets are prophesying. They're doing their thing, all right? And what happens? We've got some more messengers that showed up from the king, and they, boy, they, worship, they start worshiping God too. They join in with the prophecy time. Okay. More protection provided. Well, Saul thinks, do you know what the problem is? Those messengers. Those messengers are the problem. I'm going to send some more messengers. He sent other messengers. And they also prophesied. Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, okay. All right. These ones, these third, third guys that I'm sending to, man, they, these guys, they would never, they don't even believe in prophecy. I'm sending them. Well, they went and they also prophesied. You get a prophecy. You get a prophecy. What is happening? He himself went to Ramah, came to the great wall of Siku, and he asked, where are Samuel and David? Why doesn't he know where they are? I... Behold, they are in Naoth and Ramah. You know, before Saul, some things don't change after the Spirit. Saul appeared to be clueless before, and then after the Spirit had departed, he's still clueless. And this is the... That's it moment for him. You want something done right? What's the saying? You got to do it yourself. Every king is subject to God Almighty. For he, Saul, and no one else can resist the will of God. This is poetic. It's a bit humorous. Got to be honest. He went there and the Spirit of God came upon Saul also and he prophesied until he came to Naoth and Ramah, and it would get a little more detail with him. Uh, he gets a little rowdy. He strips off his clothes and prophesies before Samuel and lays naked all that day and all that night. That sounds pretty humiliating. Is Saul also among the prophets? So you can't help but see the humor, in it. it's, but it's a very serious truth. Saul is seeking to kill David. But God employs the tactic of uncontrollable prophecy to even fall upon this rejected king, and delay and spoil his efforts once again to nab David. From the perspective of the people at Ramah, it probably looked like a worship service stopped Saul. And so Saul's fury was stayed again. But he would eventually continue his pursuit of David. And God continues to protect David. God continues to protect David because David is awesome, right? No. No. Well, he's a man after God's own heart. That's not why God's protecting him. God protects David because God is awesome. David did not always do things right. We know right and wrong too. But that doesn't mean you alone. I, I think if we're being honest, this room could testify that Knowing right from wrong does not always keep you from doing wrong, does it? But we can learn something about David. Saul avoided and ignored God. He did what was right in his own eyes, and he didn't repent. But David ran to God as a shelter. Whether David was succeeding or in his failures, he sought refuge under the shadow of the Almighty. And so under the new covenant, forgiveness... And refuge is always available through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus, one greater than David and any other, he went to the cross to provide a covering for us so that we too could enter the presence of God. And that's why we say, to our God be the glory. Amen? All the glory evermore to him. And so you're safe under the blood of the Lamb. 
He is our Passover. He is our peace. And we are safe and secure in the arms of Jesus. There's a quote I have from a song I really, really love. Um, Beautiful song. Uh, It's called, I Have a Shelter. And this is one of the verses. It It goes like this. I have a shelter in the storm when all my sins accuse me. You ever feel like your sins are accusing you? You ever feel like you've gone too far? Come on now, be honest. When all my sins accuse me, though justice charges me with guilt, your grace will not refuse me. Where do you go? Where do you go when you fail? Oh Jesus, I will hide in you who bore my condemnation. I found my refuge in your wounds, for there I find salvation. Have you sought this kind of safety? Because the only one that can save us from our sins and from the wrath to come is Jesus. Storms are bad. Difficulties, all the things that life has that come at you from every angle, they're bad. But they're temporal. Jesus is the only one that can save us from those everlasting things that keep us outside of the presence of God. And so have you sought shelter, safety from your sins? Reason alone will not save you. Jesus can. We need a new heart. We need the gospel. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll find the best kind of protection known to man. It's the best kind of protection in the universe. That's the kind that God provides. And this protection does not have a shelf life. You don't collect on the life insurance policy because it's an everlasting protection. It doesn't end. Worship team, come on up. It's the greatness and the beauty of God that causes the church to break out into doxology. You know what that is? Doxology is a response of praise. We're going to sing. It's going to be a response of praise. But it's like what the Apostle Paul does in Romans 11. Romans 11, 33. This is in light of a beautiful truth revealed in Scripture. And the apostle says this, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. Because that's life everlasting. All things. Every day, the streets might be flooded. And a Christian can look at the streets and say, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. It's not just the sunny days. It's not just Aurora Borealis. It's every single day. Because God provides us the ultimate protection. That's the protection from sin. And being protected from sin means that you're going to a place, I'm going to a place that is free from all of it. No sickness, sorrow, pain, or death. And these light and momentary afflictions, because that's exactly what they are, are working toward an eternal weight of glory. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for people rising up, being the hands and feet of Jesus. When there's, a, when there's a disaster, seeing your Holy Spirit move upon people and, and, and aid them in whatever way they can, monetarily, supply, support, transport. But God, help us to seek protection, not just from natural disasters, from storms, but from the very sin that so easily ensnares us. Help us to run to Jesus and know that if any confession is made, forgiveness is always available. Forgiveness is always available. And you're like the father of the prodigal son, just rushing out to embrace us and take us in. We're safe in the arms of Jesus.
Thank you for that truth. Help us to sing all the glory evermore to you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Would you stand with us as we sing along? i 
King at any time and in a, through any season. <sighs> Safe, secure, in you forever. We're just saying it. That's awesome. That's awesome. All right, guys. Well, hey, continue to. It does take that, like, it's true, the eternal perspective of knowing that we are um, working toward glory, but take that into consideration, too, that we can be the hands and feet of Jesus right now to somebody that needs help. And be so thankful for the ones that are doing things for Jesus right now. And if you, you can't, you're like, well, I, I can't do that. You can always pray. Amen? You can always pray. All right. May the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you. Go in peace in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.